Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining the first on the series on Big Data Analytics and Water Security. Uh, my name is Clara Bocchino, and I'm the coordinator of the Big Data Analytics and Transboundary Water Collaboration for Southern Africa, which is the host of the seminar, which is primarily run by the IBM Research Lab uh, in Johannesburg, but also in, in the U.S., um, I see that there is a lot of you, and uh, please do not uh, fret. Uh, you are automatically on mute mode because it's easier for uh, the presentation. And uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end. If during the presentation you already think of a question that you want to ask at a specific point, please use the chat or the question tool on your panel. And I will pick up all the questions and I'll get our presenter today to answer them at the end of the presentation. So Nawid Khan is our presenter today. He's a research scientist at IBM Research Africa in Johannesburg. He is an advanced artificial intelligence team member in the Johannesburg office and also an aspiring master inventor. Um, he focuses his work on enhances core machine learning algorithms, computational framework implementation and infrastructure development that enables a team to develop and deploy deep learning projects on the cloud. You can ask more questions about that later. Uh, he develops these tools to push the boundaries in natural language understanding, NLU, NLU sorry, and part of the neurosymbolic movement making machines that learn, reason and use human knowledge in a data efficient and interpretable way. So I um, would like to give the word to Nawid for his very interesting introductory presentation. And I look forward to the presentation and to the questions and answer later on um, after uh, the end of the session. Uh, like I said, please use the question tab um, and don't talk during the presentation so that we can go through that and then we can um, ask questions in a coordinated manner. Thank you all. Um, Nawid, the word is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'm Nawid Khan, research scientist in the Johannesburg lab. Um, today I'm going to give you an introduction to machine learning for big data, for big data. and it's, it's a very high level uh, description of machine learning. I won't go into any maths. Uh, it's the basics, it's going to be a bit broad, um, but hopefully anybody who isn't a machine learning expert will be able to understand it. So firstly, a little bit about IBM. Uh, IBM is an enterprise technology company uh, driven with over 350,000 employees across 175 countries. Uh, and IBM's mantra is to build trust and to be a responsible steward of technology. In terms of business, IBM is world's number one in AI for business, hybrid cloud, enterprise systems and services, as well as uh, technology-based enterprise security. Uh, and more importantly for us, we are the leaders in terms of research in quantum computing, blockchain technology. Uh, we're the leader in US patents uh, for the past 26 years consecutively. Uh, and we have the top two supercomputers in the world to our disposal. Um, and the interesting thing there is uh, they tend to use these supercomputers for a lot of uh, the water based and weather models uh, that are run around the globe. Uh, a bit about the research division that I'm a part of. Um, the organization, uh, this division is 3,000 members strong across 19 different locations. And the focus of IBM research is on technical eminence within the scientific community. Uh, and that goes to show by looking at the, the different awards that different IBM researchers have uh, amassed over the years. Uh, it's no small achievement. So the topic at hand is about artificial intelligence, um, more specifically machine learning. And it's a topic that many people have seen on their feeds, on your social feeds, across, uh, across your Twitter feeds, all kinds of uh, blog posts and articles. And a lot of them have got to do with the conversations around the ethics of AI. And that's a very valuable conversation to be had. But for now, I want you to suspend all of those ideas uh, and instead of looking at the ethics, we'll be looking at the technical implementations and just the basics of, of AI and machine learning. In order to understand uh, what AI is, it's good to look at where it came from. Um, and when I talk about where it came from, I'm talking about peer-reviewed academic uh, articles. So 
the terms that initially popped up when it came to AI came as far back as the 1940s, where the word neuron first appeared. Um, and these terms were taken in collaboration with work that came out of the medical fields. Um, in the 1950s, uh, the term artificial intelligence was first coined, and an important work out of 1957 was the idea of the perceptron, so being able to use neurons as a computational building block for, for doing learning. Uh, but after the 1960s, around 1970s, there was what we call an AI winter, where there weren't a lot of publications within the AI space. Um, but following after that was a, a bloom in AI, with seminal work coming from Julia Perel and uh, Jan LeCun and Hinton, and most people in the space know about these works, where ideas like backpropagation came out, and those were pivotal in uh, getting the learning systems that we have today. So that was then. Since then, um, I'd like to draw your attention to a specific data challenge that came out around 2010, which is called ImageNet. And this is where the, the first real ideas of big data start coming out uh, to play. ImageNet is a challenge of uh, image classification, where we have about 14 million images that were hand annotated by individuals one by one uh, into 20,000 different classes. So one of the first big data challenges within uh, the image recognition domain. And back then, the systems that performed state of the art were nowhere near uh, the human level performance. And those systems were largely rule-based systems that were developed. But since then, three things have changed. Uh, the first that I wanna highlight is growth of computational power. So most of you know about Moore's law, Moore's law said that uh, the amount of computational power would double, either through a shrinking of the transistor chips or those transistor chips becoming cheaper in order to produce. Um, and while we had single-threaded performance that strictly followed Moore's law at the beginning, it tended to taper off um, as we started reaching the, the limitations of what we can process. And I think now we're sitting at a seven nanometer uh, production quality CPUs. Um, but since then, we've moved into GPU computational power. So instead of having one chip with a lot of processing power, we'd have many chips that do that power. Um, and GPUs have since been following Moore's law quite strictly. The other thing that changed is there's been a lot of growth development and generation of data in the human race. Like if you take a snapshot of every 60 seconds, um, in 2018, the human race consumed 97,000 hours of Netflix videos, um, which is a massive amount of data. Or the Weather Channel um, serves over 18 million requests every 60 seconds for weather information. That's a lot of data that we actually have to process. Um, and that's partly because we've got so much more computational power. But these two are combined in a very interesting way. Um, with data and computation. And the third building block that we had um, that came around the 1950s was different kinds of algorithms. So the algorithms that were developed them, um, at the beginning it was very simple, not as complicated as this, just uh, two, two layer neural networks. But this is the, the base image that I'm gonna use for a lot of my explanation of what is uh, a neural network. So um, these newer kind of algorithms were developed um, so instead of handcrafting a program, all you do is you'd feed it data, it would pass through the network, and it would output that the image you gave it was a cat. Um, and this is a new kind of algorithm that was developed. So with these three building blocks of data computation and algorithms, uh, the ImageNet challenge since 2012 saw a resurgence to the point where deep learning techniques uh, surpassed human level performance. And in 20, 2015, ResNet systems um, were, were the breakthrough there. But I'll talk more about the different kinds of deep learning in a little bit. So these systems are all what we call specialized AI. They can do one task and do one task very well using these neural networks. And there's many application domains like language translation. I'm sure we've all seen Google Translate. Uh, different speech translation, natural language processing uh, techniques, as well as visual recognition systems. Um, but 
let's now dive a little bit into what is machine learning, right? Machine learning is built on three, has three fundamental arms to it. Uh, one is supervised learning, uh, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So I'll go into each of these, but let's start broadly about machine learning, the process itself. So on the left-hand side, you'll see what used to be the traditional algorithm. You'd get an input and then a developer or a researcher would have to exhaust a lot of brain power in order to create these handcrafted rules and these flow diagrams of how to process and sometimes injecting the intelligence into it uh, to give you this algorithm. But these days we don't need to create these algorithms from scratch. All you have to do is uh, use data in order to train a model, right? So the, the general process here for machine learning is that uh, data gets fed into a model and that model will make a prediction based on what it's seen. Um, and using techniques like back propagation, what will happen is if that prediction is incorrect, then error signals will propagate from the prediction all the way back up the model uh, in order to identify what were the contributing factors uh, to getting the prediction wrong. So that's machine learning just in general. So to understand how a neural network works, um, say for example, I pass this image back through the, the neural network. Uh, what happens is uh, it takes this image and it looks at the individual pixels of this image um, and identifies what are the numerical values of each pixel. And from it, well, the first few layers will do things like identifying what are the dark pixels from the light ones. And then using um, matrix multiplication, what it does is it passes the information from the first layers into later layers, and it compounds the information it's gained along the way. So at first, it's simple pixel values, uh, but by the second layer here, it identifies that you can combine these pixels in order to form edges. Um, and combining edges in, uh, in, a, in a way that uh, provides you features later in later layers of the neural network. And right at the end, uh, these features are combined in a way that gives you an, a direct error signal that says this uh, combination of features throughout the network means I'm working with a cat. So the, the cat label will be flared up. So to go through uh, each of the different machine learning uh, arms, the first is, uh, I think the fundamental one is, is unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning techniques allow you to do um, two main uh, two main ideas. Uh, they, you get dimensionality reduction and clustering from an unsupervised learning method. Uh, dimensionality reduction is interesting because when you're working with an image, um, and you can imagine the images that we're working with in the water space would be large satellite image with uh, that are gigabytes in size. Um, each the position of each pixel actually becomes a dimension of this image. So you're talking about orders of millions of dimensions for a single image, and the human mind can't conceptualize objects that are that large. Um, but we can still compute it. And dimensionality reduction allows us to take this higher dimensional image and reduce it down to an order of two or three, so we can actually visualize the features that exist um, for, these, for these images. And if we have these images we, uh, that share certain features uh, in this newly represented space uh, that we can visualize, what we can do is clustering algorithms in order to bring objects close to one another that share similar features. So quickly to show how that would work in an unsupervised setting, uh, using the cat example, if I passed a, uh, an image of a cat through the network, in this case, what I'm asking the network to do is compound all of the different features it learns along the way so that it identifies more abstract features with reference to the cat. But what it doesn't have is the output layer. So unsupervised learning doesn't have labels to work with, right? So this network can still learn, but those, those features that it learned don't have any kind of inherent meaning to us. That's why we need to do um, dimensionality reduction and clustering. So here's an example. Uh, of doing dimensionality reduction and clustering in an unsupervised way uh, to, to provide uh, clustering of cancerous blood cells. So in this specific problem set, we had to identify images that belong to one of four classes 
Um, and on the left hand side, you'll see that if we if we looked at just the features that came out of the raw pixels, it's a mess. But once we passed it through an unsupervised learning algorithm um, and we did dimensionality reduction, clean clusters tend to form um, that show you that certain cells actually share features that are similar with one another. And if we had labels to it, we could e easily get this machine learning algorithm to label each of these clusters as belonging to the right class. So the second arm um, is supervised learning. Uh, and here techniques um, are used for classification and regression. And a lot of uh, you will be working within the regression and forecasting space where we do predictions based on what uh, the outputs are of the neural network. Um, classification problems, uh, a simple example would be uh, fraud detection. Uh, if you have a, a banking app uh, that most people do these days, um, the transactions that flare off, off of your app, um, are they fraudulent or not? The bank has to do this kind of classification. So the way supervised learning works is now we include this last layer into the neural network um, where we give it labels to specifically look for. And those are the errors that we back propagate through. Um, so in this specific case, the last layer uh, uses a one-hot encoding. What that means is uh, if one neuron fires up, it means it belongs to a specific label. So in this case, the cat label was flared off. Um, and if a different neuron had a higher signal than that, they would back propagate through it in order to course correct which neuron should have fired up. An example of uh, visual recognition um, is largely used within the machine. Uh, here's an example of machine sorting domain uh, where we can use, use a uh, a camera system to identify to which class does an object belong purely based on the color of the object. So you can think of wherever you can apply a camera-based system, you can do classification. And the last arm of machine learning is reinforcement learning. Um, and reinforcement learning is a very interesting one and it's, um, it's slowly coming, to, uh, coming out of the, the research area and we're trying to find ways for it to be used in production environments. And it's very difficult here. Um, because reinforcement learning requires a special kind of um, environment for training. So, uh, and these are largely used within game systems and robotic systems where you require an, uh, either a simulator or some environment to constantly probe against. So the way it works, and I hope the, the video plays, but uh, reinforcement learning uh, takes an environment, that environment could be a uh, a simulator, for example, in this case, it's a it's just a simple game uh, where the agent is the machine learning agent that has a few actions that it can execute. And based on its actions, uh, it observes the effects that happen to the environment. So the environment tells it what its new state is based on the action uh, the machine has executed. Um, and at some point, certain actions lead to rewards. Um, and the, the, the machine learning algorithm goes through the process of exploring what are the right combinations of actions that will allow me to gain a reward uh, and try and maximize that reward. And in some cases, it does funny things like this in order to, to identify how to get a reward. But over time, it does get better. So those are the three main arms, but the, the actual building blocks are just neurons, uh, neurons in different configurations, neurons with um, different kinds of architectures, and there's different uh, neurons that are combined for different purposes. So at the top, you'll find some of the simpler ones like the perceptron uh, and the feedforward network. That's the ones that were conceived around the, the 1950s. Um, and then in the second row, you'll see recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, GRUs, these are the kind of networks that have a short-term memory embedded into them, which is, uh, which is good for temporal data. So if you have anything in the text or speech domain, or uh, you have anything that has a component, uh, like an IoT signal that changes over time, those kind of networks will be good for that. Um, over time though, more complicated structures started being developed. Um, at the top, you'll see deep convolutional networks. These uh, convolutional networks are good for image classification problems, anything within the image domain. So if you have 
satellite footage of the ground and you're trying to monitor uh, how quickly does a water reservoir deplete, for example. Um, and that kind of image recognition, you'd use uh, a convolutional network for that. Um, and uh, there are more complicated ones. Some of them have longer term memory, not just short term memory. Uh, like you're in the middle, uh, second last row, you'll see the differential neural computer. Those are, um, you can think of it as being uh, a neural network that has access to a hard drive. So can it write to the hard drive and read from the hard drive as actions? And that's what this neural network does. Um, but I think some of the more interesting networks that people are starting to incorporate in almost all of their work is in the bottom right corner, attention networks. Uh, attention networks look for relationships between different variables in, in order to see what is the right combination of these relationships at a given instance in time that will flare up. Uh, so transformer-based networks um, that use attention are actually uh, incorporated into state-of-the-art work right now. But as you can see, there's a lot of different combinations, a lot of different architectures and different ways you can connect neurons to one another. So an interesting piece of work uh, that originally came up um, from Google was this idea of NatNet the neural architecture search net, and it's been since developed broadly in the research community. Um, instead of getting a human to design the architecture, why not get a machine to build the architecture for the machine? Um, and this higher abstract kind of thinking has pre been proven to be very fruitful. So what happens is at the top, uh, you'll see the basic idea of a controller uh, where sets of actions get executed. And think of it as Lego building blocks. Then the machine will decide which building block to combine with which. Uh, and these are different kinds of neurons that are divided, uh, that are combined in different configurations. And over time, they add up to a very complicated structure. And on the left-hand side in red, you'll see how uh, the accuracy of uh, neural architecture search algorithms have surpassed those that uh, humans have developed in black. But there is a problem with creating uh, models that have so many parameters to them. Uh, on the one hand, you can handle big data uh, within a neural network. I mean, the neural network will compress to uh, 100 megabytes big, uh, which is a small thing for a complete program to execute a very complex function. But in order to train that neural network, you need a large amount of resources. So I showed you Moore's law before for computational power. That had a 2x growth every year. The problem is that um, train, training these neural networks that are of a larger size requires a doubling in computational power every three and a half months. So we are actually uh, requesting more computational power and at some point we'll want more than we actually have. Uh, so there is a lot of work being done within hardware and software-based techniques that try and reduce the number of parameters down, uh, which in also includes reducing the size of data sets that you need. Because right now you, you need orders of millions of images in order to train a neural network to do something simple like classify a cat from a dog. So you can imagine how much information you'll need uh, when dealing with water-based projects. A large amount of data needs to be collected. Um, and there's a a whole host of problems that come out when looking at just the data acquisition process and standardizing that process, especially when you're working across different projects and different teams. So um, this is the starter kit for anybody who's, who wants to get into machine learning. Um, and even if you're a veteran, I'm sure there's one or two tools here that you haven't seen before. Um, so the basic ones are in terms of programming, everybody works within Python. Uh, you don't need anything more than that. You can go down the R route, but that's R is for usually financial services sector, use machine learning there. Um, Git as a programming tool for uh, integrating different teams with one another is, uh, is a powerful thing. But when working with Python, uh, it's good not to manage your own environments, get an environmental manager for you. So Anaconda is great for that. Um, and if you want to program in Python, uh, the best IDE these days is Jupyter. So people are familiar with maybe Jupyter, Jupyter Lab, but there's also Jupyter Hub, which is uh, something that can be installed on a server 
uh, with different credentials for each user in in a team and everybody can log in with their own credentials and program separated from one another. So it's a great way to bring the team together. Um, once you have your data set up within Jupyter, you'll want to use a, uh, a tool like Pandas in order to visualize and manipulate your data. Um, and if you have that down and you manage to get your data in a form uh, that you think is good, you kind of, you maybe want to visualize that. And that's where LTA comes from. LTA is becoming the de facto standard within the Jupyter and Python community. And I'll show you why. It's a very powerful piece of software. Um, but once you have your program up and running, you might want to deploy it quickly to just test it to see how it will work. Uh, and Flask is good for that. But if you're working in a production environment, I'd recommend using staying away from Flask and going to something that's on the cloud for deployment, just because of the security concerns that you'll have around that. Uh, in terms of the machine learning tools, uh, if you're working with Python, you'll be familiar with SciPy and NumPy, that's your numerical computational packages. Um, or if you're just getting started, uh, Scikit-learn is actually the easiest way to be familiarized with the, the simpler neural networks, your decision trees, uh, random forests, those kinds of networks. It's, it's a great learning ground for that. Um, in terms of the, the computational frameworks for machine learning, there are three that have started to come to the fore. Um, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and Keras. But these days, Keras has been integrated into TensorFlow, so there's actually only two. Um, if you're working within the image domain, TensorFlow is a great place to start. It provides you with fine grain control over convolutional neural networks, for example, and how you can construct all of these. If you're working within the temporal domain, PyTorch is definitely the one for you. Uh, there you've got dynamic graphs that update live and you can integrate them and change them very rapidly, something that TensorFlow will never give you. Uh, my personal preference is actually towards PyTorch, but the community does seem to be moving in that direction and there's a lot of growth within that space. And if you do end up um, becoming a bit of a machine learning expert, there's two tools that you will need. Um, the one is Papers with Code. Papers with Code allows you to look at different problems that the machine learning community is currently trying to tackle and seeing who is the state of the art um, and how well do they do on that specific problem set. Uh, and you also get access to the code as well. It's all open sourced. Everything here is open sourced. Um, but if you want to keep up to date with bleeding edge science, then the IBM Science Summarizer is the best tool because it provides quick snippets for different pieces uh, of academic papers. Um, and there's a lot of papers being released these days. Everything is open sourced on archive and other resources like them. So the bottom two are, are must if you're a specialist. So just to focus on Altair quickly, for those who have started the machine learning process and you want to do some kind of visualization, this is 20 lines of code. Uh, and you can see the three graphs that get pulled up, very complex graphs. Um, there is a little bit of manipulation that you have to do before you use LTA, but that is just working with two simple columns from, um, from a pandas data frame. So if you're familiar with pandas, this will integrate very nicely. Um, and it's a tool that I've only started using recently and trying to integrate into my workflow. Uh, there's a lot of integrated um, interaction across graphs, so you can actually manipulate one graph and see the effects on another graph. So there's very powerful controls there. Um, and quickly, I do want to share one technique that um, has achieved state-of-the-art results for many people that come from different domains. For example, if you aren't uh, in the machine learning research, research space, it's very difficult for you to get access to uh, orders of petaflops of data in order to train a neural network. Um, and it'll be very difficult if you're working with spatiotemporal data as well. So the one technique that people tend to use is called fine tuning. Fine tuning is a method that brings complicated research down to the most basic level that anybody can use. So what it says is um, you'll find a neural network maybe on um, uh, papers with code. So download that neural network as is and make sure that it's in a domain that's similar to you. Then that neural network will already be trained. Now what you do is you actually chop off the last layer because the last layer refers to the labels for their data set, right? 
Now you can introduce new neurons that will reflect the labels of your data set. And as long as your data set and their data set are close to one another, so there's not a lot of domain shift, um, then you can apply uh, your data through this neural network. But what you'll do is actually freeze the layers um, in the unsupervised portion of this network so that all of the information that was there is in fact learned. And the last layer will get retrained. So, so using all of the information that was there, make it now applicable to your data. So this is a technique that has been used in new problem spaces where people don't have data sets out because there isn't a lot of data in a lot of spaces. Quickly about some of the work that IBM Research is doing. Uh, we are focusing on three main pillars when it comes to AI. Advancing AI, scaling AI, and trusting AI. And these make for very important conversations about where we're going as a research community. In terms of trusting AI, the idea is to build solutions that en enable uh, machine learning models that we can in fact trust. Uh, these models need to be need to be robust to uh, to noise, to different kinds of attacks. And I'll show you one of those attacks as well. These models do have to be fair uh, as well. So you can think of um, this algorithm is now built by a, uh, a data scientist that actually injects their bias into this neural network, as well as the data set that was collected may in fact have its own biases. So we have this embedded bias in both the data and the network. But how do we ensure that what comes out of it is in fact fair? So there are tools uh, on the IBM, uh, uh, one of the, the IBM research sites that give you access to a robustness toolbox and a fairness toolbox and also different techniques for explaining uh, what is going on, on under the hood for a neural network. Because when you have some of these deep structures, it's very difficult to pinpoint where did a problem come from and what is the outputs. Um, why does the machine make a decision it makes, which is very much the case for black box systems, which is what a neural network is. For the most part, it's a black box system. In terms of uh, transparency and accountability, there's a lot of work being done there. So you can imagine that if you create one of these neural networks, uh, you need to ensure that um, that people understand how it's going to operate. So in the engineering space, we have the idea of a fact sheet. So every piece uh, of hardware you have, your cell phone, the different components on it, all of them have uh, operational conditions. Um, you know what the voltage is of a specific component, you know what uh, beyond what voltage it would break, for example. Um, all of these ideas get fitted into, in this case, an AI fact sheet. So trying to, to make sure people know uh, how should this neural network be operated? How was it trained? What are the underlying components of it? Um, what were the test results for it? So all of these are provided in uh, a transparent and accountable way and being integrated into our work. So a quick example on the robustness side. Um, so we were talking about uh, the security concerns about neural networks. Um, in this case, we've got an image of a panda, right? And what researchers have done is they've used background noise, in this case is a special kind of noise, in order to just perturb the original image. And what comes out is something that looks like the original image. It's imperceptible what the change was due to the noise. But as you can see, the neural network went from changing the classification from a giant panda to a bucket. So there are issues with training these neural networks. Um, where noise can influence its decisions. And you can imagine how that compounds over time. If I'm uh, trying to classify which, uh, what the class is of a specific borehole, for example, and I get that classification wrong because of a little bit of noise in one instrument, uh, or somebody tries to actively attack it, then, uh, and those classification uh, classifications get used in decision-making processes down the line, uh, that becomes a big problem. So there are tools that are available for defending against these kind of robustness attacks, um, which are found on the IBM site. The, the second pillar I do want to focus on is advancing AI. So IBM is actively working in the space and there's uh, all of the work that is being driven is targeting uh, high level conferences and it's all being pushed openly 
So you can go and read any piece of work that comes out of IBM right now. Um, it's on the IBM research site and it's well sorted. But that's keeping up with state of the art. But not everybody has the time to be a researcher um, in the, the AI space. Most people have a specific task. Uh, you have your domain expertise and you want to use machine learning uh, and apply it to your workflow. So a, a tool that is being developed, it is available right now, but it's uh, it's been iterative, iterated on very aggressively, is the idea of auto AI. So I spoke about the neural architecture search. It's a very similar idea, but with a much broader pipeline. So you can imagine that um, a domain expert here doesn't need to model this complicated structure. All you have to do is upload your CSV file, uh, select how it should prepare your data. Maybe there's a few uh, manipulations between different rows and different columns, a few simple things. There are a few tools as well to clean up your data. Um, and then this auto AI system will select which model it thinks will be best for your system. Uh, you tell it what you want to predict or what you want to classify, and then it tells you what is the model. And then it trains that model and it generates the whole pipeline for you and deploys that on the cloud in a secure way. Um, and once this model is saved and open, uh, what you can do is, um, that's when things actually start getting quite interesting. Uh, now we're talking about not just training a neural network, but bring it, bringing it out into the open by having it deployed. And that's where the real power of, of AI comes in. Because we've gone through this process of training a model on the data set. But what do you do with it? You deploy it, right? Which means you can actually run that neural network on new information that comes in at test time, at inference time. Um, and this becomes a powerful thing because you have the capacity of actually uh, scaling your domain expert into new, new data points where they previously had to model those data points individually. But there's a big elephant in the room, right? That says, all of this requires you to have data that's fairly clean in the first place, right? Um, and that's a component that not many people talk about. Like most of the time that gets spent as a data scientist and as a researcher, uh, which is largely a waste of time, is the process of getting your data, just generating that data and making sure you have it is a very complicated process because of sometimes it's policies and regulations and other times data isn't available. Uh, which is the case in uh, countries like South Africa when you look at the water projects. Um, and once you have you have that data, that data needs to be uh, as noiseless as possible, right? Um, because there's a lot of manipulations that you have to do across different files in order to make sure that your data fits in a specific uh, pandas data frame so that it can be fed in through such a system. So the requirement there is for those who are uh, managers and those who are uh, part of the process of formulating projects to first go through this rigorous um, ordeal of trying to figure out what is the data we have, what is the data we need, is that data sufficient for a neural network because neural networks need a large amount of data. Um, and once everybody comes to the table and they talk to one another, then we can start talking about integrating AI. Uh, AI cannot work without having that data in the first place. So we've seen now that AI is in fact code. Uh, wherever we have traditionally had an algorithm that was handcrafted, uh, now we can start uh, integrating that code with a form of intelligence. Uh, be it neural networks, be it expert systems, um, or some kind of learning system. So the question that arises is, where will we in fact have AI um, if AI is code? And the answer is purely everywhere, right? You, you right now have a phone that you are probably listening to this uh, web webcast on, or you're sitting at your computer, and all of it is run through hardware and software. Um, and that hardware and software is in fact intelligent. It's just intelligent in a different way. It's these handcrafted rules. And now we're starting to integrate learning with these handcrafted rules side by side in order to provide uh, greater forms of intelligence integrated into the, the workflows that we have every day. So everything that I've spoken about right now is about 
um, specialized systems. Specialized systems fit a very narrow box called narrow AI. Um, we have slowly started to move away from narrow AI into broad AI. And most people, when they talk about the ethics of AI, they're actually talking about general AI more than anything. But if you look at where we are um, in terms of science and research, we've only begun the process of integrating broad AI into our, uh, into our thinking and into our knowledge. Um, when in fact, general AI is at least 30 years out, and that's just speculation of how far it is away from us. Um, and to give you a, a brief idea of each of these spaces, narrow AI is, um, is deep learning as we have it right now, specialized systems that work very well on one domain, uh, they do one task uh, to the point where it's better than the average human, uh, but it requires a large amount of data. Broad AI systems, that's where knowledge starts being integrated with the learning process. So can I tell a machine that you need to operate within uh, certain requirements, that's my knowledge to you, and then you do your learning on top of that. That's where neurosymbolic systems come in. Uh, this should enable multitasking, multi-domain uh, learning and programs there. And the interesting thing about broad AI, uh, and the, necess the necessary thing in this case, is that it will enable us to do learning on much less data. Because if I can embed knowledge uh, to a machine, then it doesn't have to go through the process of learning that knowledge from scratch. It can just work with what I gave it. Uh, general AI, which is a far way out, will be tru truly neural and uh, be modeled more on the human brain and the capabilities uh, thereof. Um, but interestingly, in, once we start injecting knowledge and reasoning into it, then we can start talking about moral reasoning. So can you build a machine that actually uh, can grow in knowledge but do so with morals that we embed in it? So to close, uh, I'd like to quote from our outgoing CEO, Gini Rometti. Um, when we look at artificial intelligence, it, um, you look at all of the different hardware and software systems that you have at your disposal day to day. Uh, the reality is it's all around us. We work with it all the time, even though we don't think of it as, uh, as a learning system. We don't think of it as uh, a system that grows with the data that we feed it and the amount of computation it has. What it does is it, in fact, enhances us. So when we talk about AI, we actually talk about augmenting our intelligence more than anything else. That's what AI means for us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I was actually thinking about the fact that I felt rather catching my breath a lot during this presentation, but I think it's good because I'm, I'm here to learn and I'm here to learn into a totally different field, which is that of artificial intelligence and be a bit more aware about everything. How does everything that makes my life easier um, actually works and functions and connects together? So thank you, Noid, for that. I have not picked up any questions from the attendees. So I am very happy to open the floor for the remainder of the time. Uh, to anybody who would like to ask a question. So if you do have a question or a comment to know it, please unmute yourself and uh, and speak into the, in, into the session. Thank you. Noid, are you sitting at the IBM office with everybody else in the big room? Noid? Uh, we we have a question on my side. Oh, great. No, no, ask, 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 <laughs> ask a question while we're waiting on the chat. Yeah. Um, hello, Clara. And hello. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, very clear. Thank you. Zahid, right? Okay. Um, yes, it's Zahid here. Yeah. Um, my, my, I think my question is quite specific in terms of uh, models and in terms of what algorithms work. Uh, what if you have space, uh, um, uh, like images that, that change over time? That would be more like the remote sensing images that we get. So it's uh, it, it's image classification with a degree of uh, temporal uh, dimension to it. Um, so, 
that isn't something that I've touched on in this talk, but there are some basic architectures like uh, CNNs that have a recurrent component to them. So you can have an image that transforms over time. So our CNNs are a thing that you can actually train your model with. But uh, I haven't personally dived into, into them, but um, the nice thing about the seminar is you get a, you're going to get exposure to a lot of different experts in the space. And the next uh, seminar, and I urge all of you to, to watch it, is going to be on dealing with spatial temporal data specifically. And that'll be very applicable to all of your work. Um, uh, thereafter, there will be work being done on IBM Peers program. And then you can see how to integrate uh, your spatial temporal information with weather data, for example, is a really big data uh, pipeline, um, one that is um, state of the art out there. Um, and there will also be a, a talk being given about uh, blockchain technologies, which is an interesting conversation to be had around trusting data that comes from different parties to make sure everybody comes to the table and everybody can uh, contribute to research in a meaning way, meaningful way. So, uh, so there are these topics that will be answered. It's just not done in this simple presentation. Thank you. Zahid and, and thank you, Naveed. Are there any other questions from the audience? I have a question here from Badiza, who's also an IBM intern through the Big Data Analytics and Transboundary Water Collaboration, like Zahid is. And he's asking, I don't know if you can do that in the couple of minutes that we have remaining, but he's asking to take you to take us through the process of moving from an experimental artificial intelligence model to deploying the model? That's an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't have any assets that I can show you right now, but there are tools that are available on IBM Cloud. Um, the tools there are like Watson Studio, um, Watson Data Platform. Um, and what it allows you to do is uh, if you want to, you can actually put your entire environment on there. So you will run uh, what is the equivalent of a Jupyter Notebook on the system uh, where you can set up everything. Uh, you can train your machine learning model. You can deploy it there as well, uh, and it will open up an API for you. Um, you can do everything on the cloud. Or you could um, have your machine learning model, at least the algorithmic part, so the architecture baked out first, um, and then upload your data and what your architecture should be, let it train and then deploy. So there's, there's many different configurations that you can have, but there's a lot of tools available on IBM Cloud that offer those kinds of services. Uh, I mean, I was talking about Flask um, as a, an open system, uh, but using IBM Cloud is probably the best way to go for deploying these models. Uh, because of one other reason, um, a neural network has, is trained on the data at one instance in time the instance that you're training it in. When new data comes in, uh, what you'll get is a kind of drift. So to use the analogy of uh, climate change, for example, all of the models that we had for climate change uh, were applicable at one stage, but now we need to rethink them based on the data we have now. Uh, it means things are getting a lot more drastic, a lot quicker, uh, and we have to retrain these models with uh, newer data that comes in. And IBM Cloud allows you to do that, where uh, you can constantly retrain, so you can actually schedule it uh, to retrain based on information that comes in. So if you have a queue of data that comes through a stream, um, then over time it will update itself with a, a once you configure it like that. Thank you very much, Namit. There is a question from Rodolfo Camacho, who's the Chief of Party for the Sustainable Water Partnership at Windrock International who's a partner in the Big Data Analytics and Transboundary Water Collaboration. Rodolfo, you are muted. You may ask a question. Hey, Clara, can you hear me? Yes, we yeah? can. Okay. Yeah, I have a question with regards to the statement about the data needs to be clean. Um, in the water resources area, we, we do a lot of consistency analysis. Let's say we have meteorological data and we take two stations and we do we compare them and say, okay, maybe something happened because the, the, the pattern is supposed to be historically, uh, they should be real correlated because uh, they are in the same geography or whatever, you know. And I just wonder if AI can actually run systems to 
detect those inconsistencies based on some statistical algorithms and so on. So it doesn't necessarily have to be pre-clean before before you analyze it. Okay. Um, so when I spoke about clean, I think I was speaking about a specific kind of cleaning process. Is where you actually have everything standardized. So you can't work with uh, a machine learning model uh, where you have one CSV file that has two rows and another CSV file that has 50 rows, for example. All of these things have to be uh, cleaned in a way that the data is consistent in itself. The data itself can be noisy. Uh, that's different. Uh, neural networks are good at handling noise. Um, and there are techniques uh, for anomaly detection, so trying to identify uh, where there are outliers. Um, some work within the unsupervised setting comes from there. So you can imagine uh, if I have clusterings that fit a specific um, a specific feature set, but I have an object that uh, shares the same label but is far from the cluster, that is an anomaly. Uh, and that anomaly can mm -hmm. come out from unsupervised learning techniques and the like. Um, but you, in order to train the model, you have to have consistency through uh, this pre-processing uh, what I call cleaning first. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you very much Adolfo, for the question. And thank you very much, Nawid, for your presentation. We have 42 seconds and counting, and I'm really not so sure what's going to happen when we reach zero. So I'm going to close it here for today. Um, Nawid, can we give your contact details to the participants? So if they want to reach out to you individually, could that be possible? Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, you can hand them my email address. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I uh, will send out the invites for next week, just after this um, this webinar is finished. So I look forward to see you all again next week. And please share um, the invitations with your network uh, so we can make the conversation bigger. Now, we thank you so much for your time. And thank you to everybody at IBM in Johannesburg, IBM Research in Johannesburg. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Yeah.